This was an extremely serious case that at the time led to internal conflicts within the Japanese government over the rights granted by the law to protect those under 20 years of age. Moreover, it was considered a significant milestone in Japan's legal system as it was the first time a person under 20 in Japan faced the death penalty due to the brutality of the crime committed. So, what really happened? And what was this crime? Join me in today's video to explore further. Let's turn back time to April 14th, 1999, a Wednesday shrouded in mystery. At 7 p.m., after a tiring day at work, Hiroshi Motomura returned home to his apartment complex, stopping in front of Dr. Number 41 on the fourth floor. The first oddity he noticed was a loosely placed newspaper outside the door. An unusual sight, since his wife, Yayoi, typically brought it inside. Upon entering, Hiroshi was struck by the chaos inside. The apartment was dark, objects were scattered, indicating some kind of struggle. His wife, Yayoi, and daughter, Yuka, were nowhere to be found. A frantic call to his mother-in-law yielded no clues. They hadn't left the house with their usual backpack. In panic, Hiroshi rushed to the bedroom wardrobe where he discovered a horrifying scene. Yayoi, unclothed and motionless, wrapped in a blanket inside the wardrobe. Hiroshi's heart nearly stopped as he realized his wife was no longer alive. The criminal investigation unit arrived quickly, sealing off the area. Investigations revealed that Yayoi, 23, had passed away with her mouth sealed with tape, hands bound, showing signs of assault. Young Yuka was also found lifeless in the upper compartment of the wardrobe, her body bearing multiple injuries. In the kitchen, remnants of a hurried meal lay scattered along with a spilled milk bottle. The victim's wallet had been rummaged through, with cash and discount coupons missing. There were no clear signs of forced entry. Police determined the time of death of the two victims to be between 10.30 and 11 a.m. on the same day. Hiroshi was ruled out as a suspect after his colleagues confirmed his presence at work all day. Neighbours reported seeing a man in his 20s dressed as a maintenance worker near the apartment complex that afternoon. Some also heard the cries of an infant and noises from Hiroshi's apartment between 2 and 3 p.m. Surveillance footage revealed that around 2 p.m., the man in the maintenance uniform entered building number 7, where Hiroshi's family lived, and left at 3.30 p.m. The uniform was identified as belonging to a local service company. By April 18th, police located an employee from the service company who was absent on the day of the murder.
The investigation continues to unfold in the hopes of soon uncovering clues to solve this horrifying case. Just four days after a horrific murder shook the community, police apprehended the main suspect, Takayuki Fukuda. Witnesses confirmed he was the enigmatic maintenance worker seen on the day of the murder. Born on March 5th, 1980, the 18-year-old Fukuda came from a family of four, including his grandparents, parents and a younger brother, two years his junior. Fukuda's life was shadowed by darkness from an early age. His father, an addict of gambling and alcohol, frequently abused Fukuda's mother, especially when money was tight. This led to a severe deterioration in her mental health and ultimately her tragic suicide by hanging when Fukuda was in middle school. Following his mother's death, Fukuda's father remarried. Fukuda, grappling with deep emotional pain and a declining mental state, struggled academically and became engrossed in the world of adult magazines and films, developing a strong fixation on sexual matters. In 1999, at the age of 18, Fukuda graduated from high school and started an apprenticeship as a plumbing technician at a local company. He officially joined the company on April 1st, 1999. However, just eight days later, on April 9th, he began skipping work choosing to spend his time in video game arcades instead. Fukuda returned to work on April 13th. Notably, his father and Hiroshi, the husband of the murder victim, were colleagues in the same company and lived in the same apartment complex allocated by their employer. This proximity likely facilitated the conditions for Fukuda's criminal actions. After his arrest, Takayuki Fukuda recounted the events of April 14, 1999, the day of the chilling murder. Fukuda, reluctant to work yet donning his maintenance uniform to avoid his father's reproach, left home at 7 a.m. Instead of heading to the company, he aimlessly wandered the streets and returned home for lunch, pretending to have been at work. Dark thoughts emerged in Fukuda's mind, a desire to engage intimately with a woman. Armed with rope and duct tape, he entered various apartment buildings under the guise of a maintenance worker. Fukuda knocked on the doors of individual apartments, searching for young women home alone. With each unsuspecting resident, his boldness grew. At 14.20, Fukuda entered building number seven and ascended to the fourth floor, where he knocked on Hiroshi's door. Yayoi, 23 years old, opened it, holding her baby, unsuspecting of the man in the worker's uniform claiming to check the water pipes. Once inside, Fukuda sneaked into the kitchen and bathroom under the pretext of inspection, simultaneously scouting to ensure they were alone. Confirming that only Yayoi and her infant daughter were present, he suddenly attacked Yayoi from behind in the living room. Despite her fierce resistance and screams, she was no match for Fukuda. In a panic, he strangled her, silencing her cries. 
Fukuda then bound Yayoi's hands with rope and sealed her mouth with duct tape. When her 11-month-old daughter began to cry, he angrily threw the child to the ground multiple times. Eventually, in a heinous act, he strangled the infant with a rope until there was no response. After his brutal acts, Fukuda meticulously cleaned the crime scene. He used cleaning solutions to wipe away fingerprints and traces, then hid Yayoi's body in a wardrobe and placed her daughter in a plastic bag in the upper compartment of the wardrobe. Before leaving the scene, Fukuda rummaged through Yayoi's wallet, stealing cash and vouchers. He then spent the money on snacks and went to a friend's house to play video games, acting as if nothing had happened. Fukuda's crime was not only brutal, but also left a lasting impact on the society and the victim's family. In June 1999, the Yamaguchi District Prosecutor's Office filed a petition to the Supreme Court for the case of Takayuki Fukuda, requesting the death penalty. However, the petition was rejected under Japanese law, which only considers individuals adults at the age of 20. Since Fukuda was just 18 when he committed the crime, he was protected under the juvenile law established in 1948, providing lighter sentences for those under 19. On August 11, 1999, the case officially went to trial at the Yamaguchi District Court. Hiroshi, the husband of the victim, brought portraits of his wife and daughter to court, but was prohibited from displaying them due to concerns about affecting the defendant's emotions. Hiroshi felt insulted by this request, but complied. During the trial, Fukuda entered the courtroom with a desolate expression. Reminded by his lawyer, he bowed to the victim's family and apologized. However, his demeanor suggested a lack of genuine remorse. After seven months of trial, on March 22, 2000, the Yamaguchi District Court sentenced Fukuda to life imprisonment for murder, rape, and theft. Hiroshi, the victim's relative, expressed outrage at the verdict and disappointment with the legal system during a press conference after the trial. The prosecutor later met with Hiroshi, expressing sympathy and a commitment to continue appealing the case. Subsequently, Hiroshi regularly appeared in interviews, hoping to broaden the impact of the case. He criticized the legal system's excessive protection of juveniles, overshadowing the rights of victims. On March 28, 2000, shortly after the verdict, the Yamaguchi District Prosecutor's Office appealed to the Hiroshima High Court for the death penalty for Fukuda. However, this appeal was rejected on March 14, 2002, on the grounds that Fukuda was only 18 at the time of the crime and immature in thought and character. Throughout the prolonged appeal process, the prosecution gathered additional evidence, including letters Fukuda wrote to friends while in prison. The content of these letters revealed a disregard for the law and a lack of remorse, even mocking the victims and the legal system. The persistence of Hiroshi and the prosecution team garnered empathy and support from the public. This story reflects not only a horrific crime, 
but also a protracted legal battle, challenging the fairness and rights of the victims in the judicial system. In June 2006, a shocking decision by the Supreme Court of Japan stirred up a storm in the legal system. The initial verdict of the Yamaguchi District Court in Fukuda's case was annulled and the case was sent back to the Hiroshima High Court for retrial. This event quickly captured the attention of lawyers across Japan who opposed the death penalty as they decided to join Fukuda's defense team. Their aim was not only to save Fukuda from the death sentence, but also to reconsider the flaws in the legal approach to capital punishment. The number of lawyers defending Fukuda skyrocketed from just two to 21, forming a powerful and diverse defense team. Among them was Yoshihito, a prominent criminal defense attorney with experience in several high-profile cases. On May 24, 2007, the Hiroshima Supreme Court opened a new trial session. In this trial, Fukuda, who had previously admitted to intentional murder, suddenly retracted his confession. He claimed that he never intended to kill but that it was a case of manslaughter. The defense team shifted their legal strategy, presenting new arguments to improve Fukuda's standing in the eyes of the law and the public. Fukuda's lawyers argued that he grew up in a violent environment and witnessed his mother's suicide at a young age. They claimed that the loss of his mother drove Fukuda to seek the warmth and intimacy he had lost, leading to his decision to embrace the victim. However, when the victim resisted, the situation escalated, resulting in her unintended death. Additionally, the defense presented an unbelievable argument to explain Fukuda's violation of the victim's body. They suggested that Fukuda's actions were guided by a fantastical belief that sexual relations with the corpse could resurrect the victim. They even referred to the Doraemon manga, where Fukuda believed hiding the body in a closet could summon Doraemon to solve his problems. To support these claims, a psychiatrist was brought in to testify that Fukuda might have been mentally unstable and out of control when committing the crime. The defense also accused the prosecution of deliberately portraying Fukuda as a brutal criminal to secure the death penalty. These arguments from the defense team caused surprise and even outrage among the public. Some people even suggested punishing the lawyers for their irrational and incredible reasoning. The case became not just a legal debate, but a focal point of public attention, raising questions about legal ethics and how criminals are handled within the judicial system. On April 21, 2008, following a series of intense court hearings, the prosecution presented a crucial piece of evidence, a letter written by Takayuki Fukuda in prison to a friend. The frivolous and unrepentant tone of the letter shocked the judge, contradicting the image of a suspect capable of future remorse. Consequently, the Hiroshima Supreme Court decided to impose the death penalty. By February 20, 2012, 
the Supreme Court of Japan had ratified this death sentence. Fukuda's defense attorneys attempted to appeal based on a psychiatric assessment that suggested Fukuda had the mental capacity of a 12-year-old child. They used this information to argue against the death penalty, claiming the case was a severe miscarriage of justice and that Fukuda did not intend to rape and murder. However, in October 2015, the Hiroshima Supreme Court dismissed the request for a retrial due to insufficient evidence. Despite continued efforts, the appeals were unsuccessful. Meanwhile, Fukuda's father resigned from his job to conceal his identity, feeling detached from his son's actions. Simultaneously, Hiroshi remarried a colleague seven years his senior, moved by her support for his quest for justice. Under Japanese law, after being sentenced to death, the accused still has time to appeal. However, the final decision on executing the death penalty depends on the approval of the Minister of Justice. Yet, such execution orders are rarely issued, making actual death penalty cases quite infrequent. Finally, in December 2020, nearly 21 years after the crime, the Supreme Court of Japan officially rejected any further appeals from the defense and maintained the death sentence. Fukuda was left to live with an impending death over his head in prison, uncertain of when his last day would come. In the Japanese judicial system, criminals sentenced to death are not informed of their execution date in advance only being notified a few hours before the death penalty is carried out. This creates a state of perpetual uncertainty and tension for individuals like Fukuda, who live in constant anticipation of their final day. The story of Fukuda is not just a criminal case, but also a lesson on the inevitability of retribution for evil deeds. It serves as a testament to the fact that, although rarely executed, the death penalty remains an integral part of Japan's legal system. <laughs>